Hello and welcome to the first day of our Freedom Talk series in preparation for the Solemnity of St. Teresa of Avila. Today we shall be focusing on the topic St. Teresa of Avila, her profile and heritage. And with me in the studio to discuss this topic is none other than the prior of St. John of the Cross Carmelite community, Ibado, Father Francis Odibe. Father, you're welcome to the program. Thank you. It's good to have you here. I'm happy to be here. Okay, Father, let's start by asking mm. you to tell us a little about yourself. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Francis Uchenna Odigwe of the Divine Providence. Okay. Uh, I joined the Carmelites uh, in 1993 and uh, was professed, finally solemnly professed in uh, 2002. One ordained in 2002. Since then, I've been. Uh, I spent one year after my ordination at uh, the community in the Soka as the novice master. Mm -hmm. After that, I was sent to Spain uh, to study camera spirituality. There, I stayed in the house of Teresa oh. for one full year. Okay. Had the best year of my life so far. Interesting. Yes, and then after that, I proceeded to the uh, University of Comillas in Madrid. Okay. Started, and then, so that's uh, the background that um, I'm bringing to this interview. Okay. So since then, I've been working now in the formation, administration, and in the parish. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, right now we are going to be going on a quick break, and when we return, we'll delve straight into the topic. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. So straight to it, Father, mm -hmm. from what you said during your introduction, mm -hmm. you said you spent some, uh, I think a year yes. in um, Avila. Avila in the house of St. Teresa. Yes. That is to say you know a lot about the saints we are discussing today. A good so, deal, but not... Uh, <laughs> You know, you cannot know someone hundred percent. Okay. But I'm discovering her just like every other Carmelite every day. But I have something to share. Yes. All right. Tell us about her. Okay. Uh, Since Teresa of Avila, Teresa of Jesus, uh, her proper name uh, was uh, Teresa Cepeda de Ahumada. She was born on the twenty third day of March in fifteen fifteen. And uh, she lived her life and died uh, in um, 1582. Okay. Yes, within that period, she started off, you know, early in age, you know, she, but, but her parents, she were Alonso Sanchez de Cepeda, that's the father, and the mother was Beatrice Ahumada, and they brought her up. Very well. In fact, at the beginning of her life, she was introduced to the spiritual life. Uh, she, her father, made sure that she read the story of the saints, and that nurtured her spiritual life such that very, very, very early in her age, she was already drawn to spirituality, to prayer, to silence, to uh, self-giving, to do self-giving to God. For example. It is on record that uh, she and her brother Rodrigo, at a point, desired martyrdom. They left Avila and they wanted to go to the land of the Moors, that is the land of the uh, Muslims, which then would be like Algeria, because then they heard that if you get to that place, you'll be killed, you'll be martyred for the faith. And so she desired that. In fact, she was on her way going when um, her uncle accosted her and her brother Rodrigo. Rodrigo and brought them back to the family. That's uh, one of the things that she demonstrated that very early in her, in her life. And then she was also drawn to silence and prayer. She would always withdraw to a quiet place to pray, to imitate the saints. Uh, that was her life. And until her mom died, at the age of 14, she lost her mother. Immediately after the death of her mother, she consecrated herself to Our Lady, asking Our Lady, to now take over as her mother. 
and according to her own testimony, a lady never failed her. So you can see that was the beginning of a spiritual life. Now, this continued, but after a while, you know, of course, because of the fact that her mom was no longer in the picture, uh, it was natural for her to, as an adolescent, to derail in the sense that she lost that desire for God somehow, somehow. Not like she committed any sin or anything, but the, the fact that the desire for prayer was no longer there, and she was always found in the company of a, a cousin, a boy, that had influence on her. So her father did not like that. So she was sent out of the home to the Augustinian nuns where she stayed and there they revived that spiritual life in her. You know, the desire to give herself to God. And it was there that she got her vocation to the Carmelite order. At the, later on she left the, them and joined the Carmelite nuns in the monastery of the Incarnation. Very close, within the outside the walls of Avila. So um, she went, joined them, and stayed with them, and um, made her profession on the second day of November, 1535. Then shortly after her profession, she became ill. She, you know, she got this illness that lasted for long and really took her life. She thought she was going to die. But in that moment also, she experienced an intense you know, presence of God. Because you see, if you look at her testimony, yes, she was experiencing you know, excruciating physical pain. But at the same time, there was joy, there was peace in her, which um, is something mysterious. God's own way of drawing her. Later on, she was, you know, through the intercession of St. Joseph, cured. That was years later. Then at the Monastery of Incarnation, they had a problem. Not just, you see, what prompted the reform was the decadence in the church. In the life of Teresa, she experienced a Carmelite monastery that was supposed to take only 80 nuns. That ended up taking about 180 nuns. And there was a class distinction in the community then. There was also something that uh, the class distinction was such that if you're a nun, you, you are given a, <laughs> a particular place according to the title. Then they were supposed to be nuns, but then some of them were known as donya, just like okay, what does that mean? ladies. Okay. Uh -huh. You know, it's a title given to a special kind of ladies in the society. They brought it into the monastery also. Her, as a donya, mm. had an apartment to herself okay. with servants. As a donya, she was one of the first class nuns in the monastery. So she lived there. That was the kind of life that they lived in the monastery of incarnation. Okay. Uh, and it was okay for them at that level. But then, you see, one day she discovered something new. That that was not supposed to be the life of a Carmelite. Okay, um, Father, let me cut you off okay, there. Sorry. And then we'll go to the next question. Okay. I think we'll, we'll, still, we'll still give you time to continue on that okay, later. Okay. So a few days ago, we celebrated the feast of Saint Therese of Lisieux. She is also one of the saints in the Catholic Church. Yes. So a lot of people tend to confuse the two saints, Saint Teresa of Avila mm -hmm. and Saint Therese. So what makes them different? Okay. How do we differentiate them? One of them, Saint Teresa we're discussing now, mm -hmm. is Teresa of Jesus. You know the Carmelite order, when you join the Carmelite order, you take a pick a name. Like mine, as I also introduced myself, I said Francis of the Divine Providence. Now, her professional name was Teresa of Jesus. The same person is Teresa of Avila. The same person I told is Teresa Cepeda y Ahomada. The same person. Now, this one lived in between 1515 and 1582. Now, years apart, you have centuries. Okay. Yes, in the 19th century, you have another Teresa, a French sister now, that joined the Carmelite order, reformed by this other Teresa earlier, about three or four centuries earlier. So she found herself now, joined these nuns in a place called Lisieux. And then she took the name Teresa of the Child Jesus. Okay. 
Okay. That's her profession. She's also known as Teresa of the Little Flower. Oh. She's also known as Teresa of the Narrow Way. And then Teresa of uh, Holy Face. The same person. Okay. Her proper name, Teresa Martins. No, the French name, you know, these people call it Teresa. The French, they call it Therese. Therese okay. In English, we call it Teresa. Okay. Even the, 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 the spelling, sometimes we put T E R E S A. Some others put T H. Yes. Uh -huh. That's a base. So th that's the difference between two of them. Now, the age, this one lived only for 25 years. Therese, the French sister now, lived only for 24 years. The Teresa of Jesus of Spain. If, if you like, call her the mother, and this is the daughter now. Okay. Uh -huh. Lived for 65, 68 years, I think so, between 65 and 68 years. Okay, thank uh, you, so, Clara, now. Yes. Uh, okay, so, um, Father, we learned that St. Teresa of Avila was a doctor. Yes. So can you expand on that? What kind of a doctor was she? Was she like a doctorate degree holder, mm. or was she a medical doctor? Okay, now, <coughs> in the Carmelites, no, not the, in the church, you know, people are proclaimed saints as mothers. The, the, the reason the church declares some individuals, some people who are outstanding in the spiritual life as saints is to project them as models of the Christian life for others to follow. Now, among them, you have some of them who receive from God special grace and they communicated this grace in the sense of the kind of teaching. It's not new. It is an expansion of the teaching with the gospel of Christ, but in a particular way. Okay, Father, just hold that thought. At this point, we are still going on a quick break, and when we return, we we'll finalize on that. Stay with us. So, Father, you were talking about, before the break, mm -hmm. you were talking about the, um, the St. Teresa's doctorate degree. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So, the thing is this in the church, these people that have bequeathed to the church special teachings. If you like, call them novelty. They are not novelties, no, in the sense that it's not new. It's something in the gospel, but expanded and some light thrown to that thing. Like in the case of Teresa, it's about prayer. In the gospel, you have Jesus talking about prayer, encouraging us to pray and watch. But in the life of Teresa now, you have her drawn from her own experience what it means to pray and then teaching others what to pray. She, did, she was not educated, like some going to the university or anything like that. But she received this because, in, you see, there's something known as infused knowledge in the spiritual life. The Holy Spirit can impart, can give you knowledge of things beyond your contemporaries. In the life of the sense, you see that a lot. So Teresa received this. It's one thing to receive it. It's another thing to digest it, understand it. It's another thing to communicate it. Mm -hmm. Once you're able to do this and put it down in writing, for generations to follow you, the church declares you as a doctor. A doctor that you are a specialist in, in this area, particular area, when it comes to prayer, yeah. Teresa. The Carmelite order, as we have it, exists to pray for the church. Okay. So let me put it That's that That's quite interesting. Yeah. So, um, what was... I know you have touched on this a little earlier, okay, okay. about St. Teresa's childhood. Mm -hmm. But I want to still ask, mm -hmm. what was her childhood really like? Did she encounter challenges like every other young girl? You know, people have this idea that saints <laughs> came down from heaven, they are made holy, they are like demigods, you know, they, they don't know anything like sin and they lived and they go back to heaven. So I want us, you to uh, uh, tell us, uh, did she have challenges like we do yes. today? And is it possible for people living in this time and age mm -hmm. to emulate her and also become saints? Yes, it's possible. Now, the thing about her, eh? I mean, like every other person growing up as an adolescent, she decided to explore. And she had this fr the friends around her that influenced her. One particular friend influenced her so much that she started paying more attention to her look, fashion, all of that, more than to prayer. And that caught the attention of her father. That was actually when she was moved to the monastery. Say, okay. don't stay there and let them teach you. And because she, she also developed some kind of a stubborn spirit, which the father did not like, which was on there at the beginning. Yeah. So that's area now, yes. But then, Teresa, the, that came to the Monastery of Incarnation, was a charming lady, very social. 
She had many friends. In fact, during the monastery of the incarnation, the first twenty five seven years, she she would was the assigned to her was entertaining um what do you call it the affluent people in the society. Wow. She had a way of welcoming them into the monastery okay. and of chatting with them, you no, know, and people you know felt at home with her. And some of those rich ladies would always invite her to the mon to her their homes to be with them for maybe a month. And the monastery was paid. That was the kind of thing they were doing as apostolate then. Uh -huh. So if you know they can't pick somebody who is not charming to go for that kind of apostolate. So she was good at that and she did it well. And that's the kind of thing. And even when she later on, the second conversion, came back to prayer, she still brought that. That's the reason when you look at her talking about God relationship, prayer as a relationship. Coming from experience, that relationship thing, she still brought into her spiritual life. In okay. Her uh -huh. okay, so what can you say about her role in the church's reformation? The reformation? What was her role? Okay, now, Briefly. like I told you now, uh, before then, there was decadence in the church, not just in the Carmelite order. On every congregation, the Franciscans had their own reform. In fact, what happened, what prompted the reform, because when we talk about reform, now the actual reform was the one of Luther and the others, the history of the church. Yes. What the Catholic Church embarked on is known as counter-reformation. Okay. That's the technical word. Because it was to correct, the, the, Luther and the others came in to correct the, if you like, anomalies in the church. But then they went to another extreme. These other people came now, Teresa and the others came, to rectify what they were doing because they went to another extreme to bring the thing in balance to that thing. For example, Teresa. Teresa wanted a monastery because of her experience of incarnation in San Jose, the new monastery that she founded, she wanted the number of nuns there to be limited to 13. Okay. Not one at 13. Remember, it's against the experience in the monastery of incarnation where there were 180 nuns. There was snows all over the place. Then, in the monastery of, the, of St. Joseph also, she insisted that if you are coming there, you are coming on your own. You don't come with things from your family and this and that and that, so that you don't influence the life in the house. And they were supposed to depend on the people, whatever the people brought. You don't have to go out searching for this or that or that or that. And there was strict maintenance of the primitive rule. There's something known in the Carmelite order as the primitive rule. In the Word of Perfection, chapter 2, she insists there that one of the things she wanted, people that would be faithful to their religious vows. Okay, Father. Mm. Who is St. Teresa of Avila to you, personally? Boy, that's a lovely question. She's my mother. I mean, son, struggling to live by what she has given to us, her teachings. And she has been a very lovely woman. So, Father, what are some of the heritage of St. Teresa of Avila? Thank you for that question. Eh? Uh, my understanding of that is uh, what is it that she has bequeathed yes, to us yes. as her sons and daughters in the church? Eh? Yes. The first one is uh, the, the, the category, the way she categorized the ascent of the soul through prayer to God, the stages that the soul passes through. Uh -huh. And the first one is at the stage what today is known as mental prayer. It is the stage whereby the soul um, reflects, withdraws to, from the world, gets into itself through penance, that is ascetical practices, exercises, spiritual exercises that you carry out. They withdraw it from the world and bring you closer to God. And the soul begins to contemplate the passion of Christ. That's the first stage. The second stage now is where this particular soul begins to learn how to surrender his will to God. And this comes in the, what is known as the devotion of peace, you know, where you learn how to just be in the presence of the Lord. This is also an exercise that you carry out, it takes you to this level. Then the third level is the beginning of the mystical experience, where there's rapture. Rapture is the God himself coming into that situation, taking over, okay. controlling the person, reveals himself to you, launches, if you like, into that spiritual life. In fact, it's at this stage that what St. Paul talks about is St. Paul says that we do not know how to pray, that the Spirit prays in us. 
That's a spirit praying now, you know, yes. in a mystical way. Yes. And then the fourth one is the union of mind and heart with God that happens. That is the prayer of union. That's three, four stages actually, yeah? And which Teresa illustrates using four waters, which we're not going to now. Yeah? That's the first one. The second one is uh, the under heritage is high definition of prayer. Okay. Prayer is a relationship that one goes into the relationship you have with God, the one who know that loves you. In this particular relationship now, the soul desires God and stays in the presence of the Lord and is filled by the Lord. That is a relationship. Yeah. So that definition of prayer is very, very good. Now, Teresa wrote a number of books. Okay. The first one, the Libro, the book of her life. You know, that's where she taught about prayer and all these stages of prayer. Then you have the second one, also the word of perfection, which is um, her teaching her nuns. She had two books to teach her nuns how to pray and then to help them in the, in the formation, in their own personal formation in spiritual life. The interior castle and the word of perfection. Okay. You know? And then the third one now is the book of foundation. It's like the chronicle of how she founded the monasteries. Uh, not strictly uh, historical, but there are also you know, some spiritual things there. And then you have the um, concepts of love and the, the poesy, uh, the, the poetry that she wrote. So, and then there's something about Teresa now, one of the heritages is her bookmark. What's in her bookmark? Let nothing disturb you. Let, 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 uh, don't be frightened by anything. He who has God possesses all things. Patience, with patience, you possess everything. God alone suffices. This will refer to on maybe towards the end you know, on another occasion. Eh? And then there's also something there that she says, which I think is also good for our time, which is the fact that God uses my hand, uses my legs, my eyes, my body to carry out whatever he wants to do. Compassion to people. So I'm invited to be the image of God that I am, the likeness of God that I am, to live out. Let's what I see that God working through me. Yeah. Okay. So these are the four things I think that um, Teresa has left for us, which if we live by, we be great. Mm. Okay, viewers, you've heard it all. I'm sure you've learned a lot from today's episode. And here, at this point, we are going to be drawing the curtain on this today's episode. We hope you are going to join us again tomorrow for another interesting, informative, and educative episode. Thank you. And remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube page and turn on your post notification bell to know whenever we post new videos and whenever we are hosting live events at this Cars Carmelite House of Study Media Ibadan. Okay. And if you would like to have a retreat or quiet time with God, the Carmelite community in Ibadan has a conducive atmosphere where you can have retreats for yourself personally or for groups. If you'd like to make bookings, you can use the contact that is displayed on your screen. For us right here in the studio, it is bye for now. Thank you. God bless you. Mm -hmm.